uh, yeah, because that uh, seems to uh, get you more viewers. Yes, that's awesome. all right. One second here. And let me shut this thing off so you get no feedback. And uh, there we go. And all right, thank you. This is, uh, I guess you got some people here because they lived in 1964 and uh, want to talk about 1964. So um, I'm just checking. Uh, we got uh, yeah, we got one person from Michigan who uh, has not seen that. He's my friend Kent. He hasn't seen this talk, and uh, there are some others in here. So. There you go. Um, so I hope they uh, enjoy it. And uh, I have no rules. If you have something to say, you go ahead and say it. Uh, if I was live, we could go back and forth, but it's better off in chat. And uh, so it should be good. Should have fun. And I don't have a headache and I don't have any side effect from the Pfizer shot. So I guess I'm, I'm fine. which is a good thing, so. And uh, so, oh, we still got 13 minutes, so. So as everything up in Rye, I imagine the uh, weather is uh, awful nine miles up the road from me. Oh. No problem. Actually, Evan, it, um, we had a start time a little earlier, so whenever you're ready okay. to begin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I didn't realize that, so. No, that's Okay, so yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, we're, we're so uh, okay, you. I want to I want to thank thank Catherine for inviting me, and uh, I want to thank everybody else who is here. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner. Uh, I am uh, well. I've been a broadcaster since 1971 when I was at Spring Valley High School in uh, Rockland County, New York, uh, in 11th grade. Joe Denicio said to me, my English teacher, "You have a good voice, uh, student." How would you like to be on radio? And I said, yeah, the worst way I want to be in radio. And I was. Um, I ended up uh, on WRKL radio, which you can get in Westchester 910 on the dial. It's all Polish now. And I worked for the Journal News and the Bergen Record, thanks to Joe. And to make a long story short, uh, I was on WNEW radio starting in 1978 at the age of 21. Uh, because uh, John Lindsay happened to tell me in Nyack that he was running for Senate in New York in 1980. I get a call from WNEW. They, they were the adults. They had William B. Williams on, Julius LaRosa, and all those people. Julius LaRosa was one of the nicest people I ever dealt with. And uh, Henry Marcotte called me and said, well, can we buy that report from you? I said, yes, we can. Um, how much are you going to pay me? Ten bucks sold. So for three and a half years, I was doing Work at 50,000 Watt WNEW Radio, the home of the New York Football Giants. Uh, and the New York Football Giants were owned by Wellington Mara, who lived in Rye. Uh, 1964. 1964, the first baby boomers born in 1946 become adults. And this is not political in any way. I am just going to tell you who some of the most prominent American baby boomers born in 1946 were. And uh, they start as soon as this thing gets going with this guy who you probably know, Donald Trump and George W. Bush and Bill Clinton, all born in 1946, all presidents of the United States, all baby boomers. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed in July of 1964 that outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It prohibited unequal application of the voter registration requirements in racial segregation in schools, employment, and in public accommodations. And there is Lyndon Johnson signing it into law behind him, the Reverend Martin Luther King, and that tall, good-looking guy back there uh, facing right, uh, former uh, mayor of New York City, who was a congressman at that time, John Lindsay, who I owe a great debt of gratitude because he helped my career so much. So there you go, John. John Vliet Lindsay. Uh, and it was on August 7th that Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which basically blew up the Vietnam War in terms of the Americans. Uh, it authorized Lyndon Johnson to take any measures he believed were necessary to retaliate and to promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. That is political talk. Uh, and there is Johnson uh, after getting the Gulf of Tonkin resolution enacted. 
Uh, the summer of 64 featured a lot of rioting in Harlem, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in Jersey City, and other places throughout the United States. Uh, for instance, that is uh, a picture of uh, 125th Street uh, in Harlem uh, during one of the uh, demonstrations or rioting. There is a guy who uh, is in uh, Rochester, New York, part of uh, the rioting up there. And uh, these guys came to the United States back uh, on February 7th, 1964. You might have heard of them. I don't know. Have they ever gone out of, out of fashion? Uh, the Beatles. The Beatles uh, land at then Idlewild Airport, soon to be renamed JFK. And uh, George Harrison actually has a bag that says the Beatles there. Uh, and uh, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, wins the heavyweight championship of the world by defeating Sonny Liston. Uh, amazingly enough, uh, both the Beatles and Muhammad Ali would become 1960s icons. And uh, we have a story by Bob Lipside about how he was there the day they met. And he didn't give it any thought about, uh, and Bob's a friend of mine, lives out on the island, used to be with the New York Times and uh, also uh, PBS. And he didn't think anything of the Beatles meeting uh, Cassius Clay. Uh, back in 1964 in this book that uh, he has out called The Ex uh, Accidental Sports Writer that uh, you probably have in the library and you'll hear the story I'm going to tell that's in that book. Oh, Fidel Castro is still around. Fidel uh, making his debut in 1959 as a dictator. And here he is in 1964 playing baseball. And my old buddy, Jose Valdivicio, who played uh, shortstop with the Washington Senators and the Minnesota Twins and ended up being a sportscaster on Channel 47 in New York, WNJU. Uh, I asked him one day, can Castro play baseball? I said, no. He said every kid who had a glove got a tryout for the Washington Senators, the team that Jose played for. And they just lined him up and said, OK, you look like a prospect. The rest of you go home. Fidel was sent home. And there is Nikita Khrushchev holding a chicken. Nikita Khrushchev is in his last year running the Soviet Union. Uh, Cyprus independence from British rule, a problem uh, in 1964 because Turkish Cypriots, Greek Cypriots uh, were clashing against one another. That started in 1963 and uh, there's a picture of that. And uh, some of you might have, remember going to this place, the New York World's Fair. And some of you, I bet you snuck in around the Grand Central Parkway on that trash can and went over the fence. I've heard that story from more than one person from more than one area. Uh, let's talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in public places, banned employment discrimination, Let's hold it right there. It didn't ban employment discrimination because if you were a woman uh, and uh, you were in college and, uh, oh, Don worked at the World's Fair in 1964. Hey, Don, did you uh, catch any of the people that came over the uh, garbage can uh, by the Grand Central Turnpike, uh, Grand Central Parkway? Anyway, uh, it didn't ban discrimination because if you were a woman working on a college campus as a teacher, uh, you could be fired or be denied tenure and nobody had to tell you anything. You were just denied. Uh, and it would be another eight years before they took care of that. So employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, uh, except for college employees, educators. And there is uh, Lyndon Johnson signing in, uh, signing the bill, giving a pen to Martin Luther King, creating the uh, 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, let's talk about how we got here, because how we got here is kind of interesting, because the Civil Rights Act was ready to go as early as 1875, and it took 99 years to get there. Uh, following the Civil War, there was a trio of uh, constitutional amendments, one abolished slavery, which made the former slave citizens, and gave all men, notice it's all men, men, not women, men, all men the right to vote regardless of race. Women did not get the vote back in 1875 when the first real Civil Rights Act was ready to go. Um, hey, these are the guys meaning about what we should be doing after the Civil War, what can we do, and how do we put the union back together? Uh, and then, well, hey, people had the right to vote, right? Except some areas said, no, we're not giving you the right to vote unless you give us money to vote, 
poll taxes, uh, unless you take literacy tests and there were other measures to keep African-American citizens disenfranchised. And there was the strict segregation throughout the South, the Jim Crow laws. Uh, and uh, there was violence from groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, here is a, uh, a cartoon from uh, that era, the 1870s, uh, where you had to put your, or you had to have money if you were a black man to vote. Uh, or if you're a white guy, you just voted. There was no problem. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 is notable. It was the last piece of legislation related to the Reconstruction that was passed by Congress during the Reconstruction era. That included Civil Rights Acts in 1866, four Reconstruction Acts, 1867 and 68, three Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 71, and three constitutional amendments adopted between 1865 and 1870. And uh, Ulysses S. Grant was the president, and he decides he's not running for reelection. Uh, in 1876, and uh, that changes the course of history because Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes ran for president, and it looked like Samuel Tilden, the Democrat, won, beating the Ohio uh, Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, but there's a compromise in 1877, and the Democrats said, okay, to the Republicans, We'll let you have Rutherford B. Hayes as president. You could, you could have him. But we want something from you. You could have Hayes. You got to give us the right for home rule in the South. And you got to withdraw federal troops from the South. And Hayes becomes president on uh, March 3rd, 1877. And one of his first acts is the withdrawal of federal troops from Louisiana and South Carolina. And that, may, that marks a major turning point in American political history, ends Reconstruction, and Jim Crow takes effect. And there is Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, the compromise effectively ended the Reconstruction era. Some Democrats said, hey, wait a minute, you know what? Yeah, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of the civil and political rights of Blacks, uh, and um, you don't have to worry about it. Of course, they didn't do that. Uh, money to vote? Yeah, you got to pay the vote. You know, it wasn't that long ago. In fact, it was January 23rd, 1964, during the year 1964, that uh, the poll tax, you had to pay the vote, the poll tax in national elections. The United States ratified the 24th Amendment to the Constitution, prohibiting any poll tax in elections for federal officials. That was in 1964. In uh, 1883, the Supreme Court basically finished off the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1875, um, and they ruled that civil cases that uh, the public accommodation section to the act was unconstitutional. It said Congress uh, really didn't have control over private people or corporations under the Equal Protection Clause, and this would now go on for the next 81 years. Um, that is the Henry Ford Museum outside of Detroit in Dearborn, Michigan. I was there in 2017, and they have signs from, um, from the past, relics of the past, like colored entrance. Or uh, there you would see a picture like this in maybe a newspaper somewhere in the 1950s. Uh, white women, colored women that way, white men, colored men that way for bathrooms, except they were separate. And you can see this guy is uh, drinking out of a colored uh, water fountain. Like it makes a difference, but that's where he gets his water. In the 1950s, the presence of segregation uh, and uh, its absence of democracy, Jim Crow must go. That starts in the 1950s. It really starts with a guy by the name of Randolph in 1941, when he told Franklin Roosevelt, hey, hire Negroes to do work, federal work. Uh, Randolph is one of uh, the major civil rights leaders. He was part of the Big Six in 1963 uh, that organized the March on Washington. Uh, some of the other things going on that uh, were part of the civil rights movement, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, 1954. Supreme Court justices ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. 
And that is the Little Rock Nine going to school in 1957, September 4th. Uh, the first day of classes at Central High in Arkansas, the governor, Orville Farbus, called in the Arkansas National Guard to block black students' entry into high school. Uh, Eisenhower wouldn't allow it after a while. He sent federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into school. Uh, it drew national attention to the civil rights movement, but that's about all that Eisenhower really did. Didn't do all that much. There were a couple of civil rights acts. 1957, uh, the Protection of Voters' Rights Act, uh, which uh, was set out in the 15th Amendment of the Constitution. And the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice uh, told federal prosecutors to obtain court injunctions against the interference with the right to vote. And the Civil Rights Commission uh, was also set up to investigate discriminatory conditions uh, when, with the voting and uh, corrective measures that they would suggest. Uh, the purpose of that bill was to increase the number of registered Black voters in the South only 20% were registered, much lower numbers in communities in the Deep South. And there is Eisenhower signing the bill. Uh, and this is what it was all about. Federal inspection of local voter registration polls by appointed referees to oversee Southern elections and ensure that African-Americans were permitted to vote. Penalties for anyone who obstructed someone's attempt to register to vote or vote. Uh, the life of the Civil Rights Commission was extended uh, by two years, and um, there were court orders, prosecution, if you interfered with school desegregation. John Kennedy comes around 1961. He doesn't really do much of anything until 1963, June of uh, 1963, June 11th, and that was about five weeks after he saw the cover of the New York Times which showed a protester in Birmingham being attacked by a guard dog, police guard dog. And um, ABC, NBC, and CBS had their cameras trained in Birmingham. And for the first time, Americans in their living room would be able to see what was going on with the civil rights movement and the protests in the South. Uh, Kennedy said he's going to seek legislation that gave all Americans the right to be served in facilities open to the public, which included hotels, restaurants, theaters, retail stores, similar establishment, as well as the greater protection for the right to vote. But you gotta remember in 1963, there was still a poll tax. Uh, Kennedy was moved to take the action after he read the newspapers and watched TV. And that leads you to July of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, well, barred unequal application of voter registration requirements, outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin in hotels, motels, restaurants, businesses, other public accommodations, prohibited municipalities, states from denying access to public facilities on the ground of race, religion, national origin, encouraged the segregation of public schools, authorized the attorney general to file lawsuits, enforcing the act and expanded the Civil Rights Commission established in 57, prevented discrimination by government agencies that received federal funds. But one thing it didn't do, women, women could be desegregated against in going to college. And women were basically ushered into these roles uh, after they graduated high school or went to college, housewives, secretaries, nurses, teachers, telephone operators. That was basically it. Very few were able to become lawyers, engineers, doctors, mathematicians, scientists. Um, so there are six titles, uh, the voting rights, public accommodations, desegregation of public facilities, desegregation, public education, commission on civil rights, non-discrimination and federally assisted programs. There would be a title nine that comes about Jan uh, June 23rd, 1972 which made colleges and universities that took federal funds, made them offer equal educational opportunities to men and women. It took until 1972. Martin Luther King would win the Nobel Peace Prize that year for his uh, leading the uh, Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference and all of the demonstrations uh, throughout the South youngest man to win the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, in 1964, he said that the uh, Civil Rights Act of 64 was nothing less than the second emancipation. 
But uh, things didn't go as well as planned. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, one of the riots that are taking place uh, throughout the country in the summer of 1964. In fact, it got so bad. You know the song uh, Dancing in the Street? Uh, Martha Reeves, I think it was, in the Vandellas. You know, we'll be dancing in the streets. J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, thought that uh, that was a signal for riots to start in the various uh, places, well, you know, dancing in the streets in Detroit, Chicago, New York, et cetera. And they spent money actually analyzing that song to see if that was a call uh, to arms in those cities. Uh, segregationists, meanwhile, were angered, angered by Johnson. They took to the streets as well. They attacked African-American demonstrators across the South, which is why you had a lot of uh, civil unrest around the country. Uh, these three guys, these three guys were killed in 1964. The guy on the right went to Pelham High School, Michael Schwer, Schwerner. And if you go into Pelham High School, or if any of you went to Pelham High School, my son went to Pelham High School, um, there is a uh, display about Michael Schwer, Schwerner. Uh, Michael uh, was a uh, high school student at Pelham, and he and Andrew Goodman of New York uh, traveled to the heav heavily segregated Mississippi in 1964. And uh, they were there to uh, organize civil rights efforts on behalf of the Congress of Racial Equality. The third man in that picture was a guy by the name of James Cheney. He is the guy, uh, as you can see in the middle. Uh, and uh, he uh, was um, a local African-American man who joined uh, Corps in 1963. On June 21st, they disappeared. Their bodies were found on August 4th. Uh, it took, 50, some 41 years, 41 years to uh, convict one of the guys who killed these three. Edgar Ray Killen was found guilty. Three counts of manslaughter, June 21st, 2005. He was 80 years old at the time. But then again, uh, I had a friend uh, who uh, was the, the UPI uh, bureau chief uh, in the South. And uh, they got him out of there because he was Jewish because they thought he was going to get killed and sent somebody else there in 1963 who told me all these stories about cops would just sit around and uh, they knew who the murderers were or, or the troublemakers were. And somehow there was a slip up in, in the investigation and they had to start the investigation all over again. And, they, and that went on and on. So, you know, Edgar Ray Killen, uh, the fact it took 41 years to solve the crime really doesn't come mu as much of a surprise. Meanwhile, decades of police brutality, and this may have um, something resonate uh, in uh, 2020. What was the movie made about the murders in 1964? Tom, I can't tell you. Maybe somebody else can uh, tell Tom what was the movie uh, made about this. Uh, but meanwhile, decades of police brutality, and tell me if you haven't heard this before, because that was 1964, and it seems that last summer we had a rerun of, in fact, a, a heavy-duty rerun or a sequel to what happened in 1964. Uh, decades of police brutality kept off by several incidences in the summer of 64 led to um, the racially motivated riots in Harlem, uh, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in Jersey City, and many other cities around the country. Um, it was a tense time. But the United States wasn't the only country that was going through this. South Africa was doing it as well. Take a look at this beach, white area only, blank and giblet, um, down in uh, South uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, the South Africans, Mississippi burning, Mississippi burning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, anyway, this is 1964 in South Africa. And you also have this. Please boycott apartheid sport. And there's pressure on the International Olympic Committee to ban South Africa from the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. And on October, or rather August 18th, 1964, South Africa was banned from the Olympics. And uh, that was in Tokyo because of its refusal to condemn apartheid. While all this is going on in the world, there's another thing. Vietnam. Vietnam is getting, is right on the front burner now. There are troops being sent to Vietnam and the uh, demonstrations would soon start. Lyndon Johnson's a war criminal. No destruction in Vietnam. The Americans go full steam ahead in Vietnam. 
Uh, it started in late 1960, Eisenhower telling Kennedy, now really don't send troops there, but Kennedy said, yeah, let's, let's send troops to Vietnam. And Kennedy said that he could not foresee us letting South Vietnam fall to communism. So in the late 1950s, during the Eisenhower administration, actually 1954, uh, Vietnam split into two countries, North Vietnam, communist, South Vietnam, which was uh, our friend, the United States friend. Uh, Cold War anxieties dictated if North Vietnamese communists prevail, the rest of Southeast Asia would fall like dominoes, the th domino theory. Uh, when he took office in 1961, John Kennedy vowed not to allow South Vietnam to fall to communism. Kind of interesting because Dwight Eisenhower and his team, Eisenhower's presidency ended in 1961, said Laos was the problem, not South Vietnam. If Laos fell, then the others would fall, the domino theory. And there is Robert McNamara, the uh, Ford Motor Company executive, one of the whiz kids over the Ford Motor Company, who probably had no business being the Secretary of Defense, but Kennedy named him the Secretary of Defense. Great bean counter for Ford, becomes the Secretary of Defense. And uh, he made some mistakes, which eventually he would talk about. Meanwhile, uh, there's an incident that might have happened or might not have happened uh, all these years later. Uh, there is still some question about what happened in the Gulf of Tonkin off of Vietnam uh, in August of 1964. Now, there were supposedly two separate attacks on two Navy destroyers, the USS Maddox and the USS Turner Joy. The Turner Joy one is the interesting one. And that occurred August 2nd against the Maddox and August 4th against the Turner Joy. The two destroyers were stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin. They were in waters that separated uh, Vietnam from the uh, Chinese island of Hanan. And um, there was a report that these two ships were attacked. So Congress goes into motion quickly and passes the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. And they tell Lyndon Johnson, take all necessary measures to repel any armed attacks against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression by the communist government of North Vietnam. August 7th, 1964 is the date when the American escalation of troops in Vietnam hits the gas and uh, they go from zero to 60 in six seconds. Now, there were Americans who had been killed in Vietnam prior to this. They were advisors. Uh, they were in an attack in January of 1963. But this is where the war really, really takes off. Now, according to the U.S. Navy, the Maddox and the Turner Joy reported being fired upon by Vietnamese patrol boats. But, well, not so sure about the Turner Joy. In fact, it's never been explained. Some people said it might have been whales just jumping up and down that was mistaken for a ship. And they report that they were attacked. Anyway, the reports go in, and that's the escalation. Um, nobody seems to really want to tell. There are stories out there, the official story of the Turner Joy. And there is Lyndon Johnson, and he's a wartime president. By January 1965, 5,400 men were called up to the draft. By uh, December of 65, 45,000 men were called. Uh, the draft rose from 17,000 men per month to 35,000 men. I have to say one thing. There were women also in Vietnam. They were uh, nurses. They were executive aides or secretaries. And in 1965, uh, Dickie Chappelle, who was a uh, writer who had covered uh, the uprising in Hungary in 1956 and was arrested there, uh, she became the first journalist to be killed in Vietnam, and she's buried at, uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. And um, demonstrations would start shortly after that. Meanwhile, look at that guy in the square hat on the left, Nikita Khrushchev. I guess that's the latest in uh, Soviet haberdashery back in 1964. And the guy on the right is Leonard Brezhnev, who's number two in the Soviet Union. Well, uh, the Soviets got a little tired of uh, Nikita. And they thought he, he was a hothead and they, they thought he was giving in too much to uh, the United States and he had screwed up the relationship with China, although Mao Zedong may have screwed up the relationship uh, as well with the Soviet Union. So back in the USSR, it's a song by somebody, I forgot who did that, back in the USSR. October 15th, 1964, Nikita Khrushchev says, so long, 
probably didn't say so long like that, but he's removed from office and he's replaced by Leonard Brezhnev. And that would become a pain to Lyndon Johnson eventually. And there is uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev in happier days in 1961 when uh, the two of them met in the summit in 1961. Oh, and there is uh, Khrushchev with uh, his uh, North American ally, Fidel Castro, uh, 90 miles off of the American coast down in, uh, in uh, Cuba. Uh, in 1962, Khrushchev deployed nuclear missiles in communist Cuba, easily within striking distance of Miami or Tampa or Atlanta or Washington or New York. And the United States knew that uh, the missiles were only partially developed and there wasn't really much of a threat, but remember it escalated and escalated and escalated. And those were the days of fallout shelters. I remember being in school and having to hide under a desk, duck and cover uh, in case a nuclear bomb went off. And me being a, a wise guy in school, I told my teacher, Mrs. Feinstein, why am I under a desk? And it doesn't make any sense. If, the thing is going to go, it's going to go and hiding under a desk isn't going to help me. And she couldn't come up with an answer as to why I should hide under a desk, duck and cover. Kennedy uh, in 1961 had authorized the failed Bay of Pigs invasion and said uh, in the, what he did with, with Khrushchev uh, in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis said to Khrushchev, okay, we're not going to attack Cuba. And we're going to take our nuclear weapons out of Turkey. All this was declassified around 1997. Uh, and um, it was a big deal in 1962. But if you look at it in retrospect in 1997, 98, it was just a minor inconvenience that um, the United States had put missiles in Turkey. The Soviets were reacting by saying, we'll put missiles in Cuba. And they just pulled it out. Uh, and there is uh, Mao Zedong and uh, Nikita Khrushchev, also in happier days before uh, they had a fallout around 1958. Uh, the two countries start calling each other names. Khrushchev called Mao Zedong the leader of communist China or red China. Thank you, Stewie Gates, my ninth grade teacher, who uh, in 1969-70 batted that into us. Communist China, red China. Uh, Khrushchev said Mao Zedong was a left revisionist who failed to comprehend modern warfare. And I love how, how Mao Zedong criticized Khrushchev. A psalm, reading, psalm singing buffoon. Psalm singing buffoon who underestimated the nature of Western imperialism. And uh, eventually Nikita would be sitting on a park bench like a lot of old men reading the newspaper. Uh, the break uh, with China, food shortages in the USSR uh, eroded Khrushchev's standing in the eyes of other high-ranking officials, including Brezhnev. And uh, they were bothered by what they thought was an erratic tendency to undercut their authority. And oh, uh, look at that man. He's all smiles, isn't he? Oh yeah, Leonard Brezhnev. But Brezhnev would cause problems in 1964 because after taking over, he basically told Lyndon Johnson this. The Soviet people see their international duty in the support of the just struggle of peoples against imperialism, colonialism, neo-colonism, uh, colonialism rather, uh, for their social and national liberation, for peace, democracy, national independence, and socialism. And Brezhnev had his eye on one country, North Vietnam. We are coming out for an end to the arms race between the United States and the Soviet and general and complete disarmament and for relieving the peoples from the mounting burden of military expenditures. But this was, his, this was the guy of his affections, Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader of North Vietnam, who after the World War II actually reached out to the United States looking for help to get away from French colonialism. The United States wasn't too interested. On uh, November 17th, 1964, another flare up in the Cold War, the Soviet Politburo decided to send increased support to North Vietnam, and that included aircraft, radar, artillery, air defense systems, small arms, ammunition, food, and medical supplies, and meant that North Vietnam was fighting a proxy war against the Americans. As you can see there, uh, another uh, problem in the world in 1964, fighting between the ethnic Turks and Greeks on Cyprus, 16 people are dead. 
Uh, this started in 1963 with the two main ethnic groups on the island deciding they can't live with one another. In March of 1964, the United Nations sent in 7,000 peacekeeping uh, force men uh, in Cyprus to try to keep the peace, which they did limitedly for a few years. And Lyndon Johnson decided he was going to get involved with all this because he called uh, Turkey and said, hey, you never think about the military moves that you might want to do in Cyprus. Uh, if I were you, I'd back off. Uh, you don't want me to get mad at you. Anyway, Lyndon had other problems. Um, and uh, they listened to him for the time being, uh, and that would uh, break out again in years later on. On August 10th, 1964, the UN broke in another ceasefire in Cyprus, and it diffused the crisis, at least temporarily, between the Greek and Turkish Cypriots, uh, and told Turkey to back off. The conflict would continue for years. Nelson Mandela. Oh, he's in the news in 1964. Nelson Mandela uh, is sentenced to um, life in prison for committing sabotage against South Africa's apartheid government, but he did avoid a possible death sentence, but he's sent to prison for the rest of his life on June 12th, 1964. Well, you know those guys, if you're a certain age and used to watch Ed Sullivan. Uh, Jackie Mason was thrown off Ed Sullivan around 1964 for all the snow. On my TV talk, I talk about that because Jerry Stiller was my cousin and talk about Ed. Anyway, uh, let's talk about Ed because he didn't see these guys. Walter Cronkite saw these guys in 1963 being mobbed in an airport in London. He calls up Sullivan, tells him about this, and Sullivan decides, hey, let's book the Beatles who flopped in 1963 on the American uh, pop charts, but uh, they blew up after uh, a guy by the name of uh, Carol James, who was working for WWDC in Washington, D.C., got a request for one of their songs. He started playing it. Other radio stations started playing it, and the British invasion was coming. On February 9th, 1964, 73 million Americans, I'm one of them, gathered around the TV set, the old black and white TV set with antenna or ears, to see, ladies and gentlemen, here they are, the Beatles. And Ed Sullivan points to them, and the rest is history. And there is uh, Ed from Port Chester, New York. There is a street, Ed Sullivan Street, over in Port Chester, not far from the library. And uh, he is with the Beatles, uh, Ringo Starr, George Harrison, Ed Sullivan, John Lennon, and Paul McCartney, and Beatlemania in America starts. And that is my buddy, Robert Lipside, Bob Lipside. I've known Bob forever, so it seems. And uh, Howard Cosell introduced me to Bob way back when, telling me that Bob was one of the good guys. Bob is one of the good guys. Anyway, uh, he lives out uh, in the Hamptons, and uh, he wrote a book called The Accidental Sports Writer, which you might have uh, in your library. And uh, Bob and I were talking one day about uh, being locked in the room with the Beatles in Miami Beach in February 1964. And the uh, the world where where worlds collided. Now let me give you a little background on Bob. He was working for the New York Times, and he's down in 1964 in Fort Lauderdale covering spring training for the New York Yankees. And the New York Times sports desk said there's something going on at Cassius Clay's gym. The Beatles are going to be there, and they're going to meet Cassius Clay. Why don't you go down and cover it? And Lipsight didn't think anything of it. In fact, he thought very little of it. But, you know, an assignment is an assignment. Your sports editor says, go down, you go down. And he goes down to the Fifth Street gym in Miami Beach. And uh, they let him in. And then they let the four Beatles in. And he is stuck in a room with John Paul George and Ringo for about a half hour as they wait for Cassius Clay. Uh, and uh, Bob, and probably you could get the book out of the library, uh, Bob's book. Uh, told me, he said, yeah, he said, Paul, George, and Ringo, they're pretty good guys. They weren't a problem. John Lennon was a problem. He did not want to be there. It was early in the morning. His clock wasn't used to be up early in the morning. And also, they brought him to see not the guy he wanted to see. He wanted to see Sonny Liston, but Sonny Liston didn't know who the Beatles were. And uh, so he, he didn't care. But uh, look, Cassius Clay is Cassius Clay, and he's looking for any kind of publicity he could get. 
as he's in the uh, heavyweight championship bout coming up a couple of weeks later with Sonny Liston. So Bob is uh, sits there with the four Beatles and Lennon is uh, saying that uh, I only associate with winners and Sonny Liston is a winner and uh, Cassius Clay, you know, this guy is going to lose. And why am I uh, here? Because I don't associate myself with losers. This is going on for about a half hour. Worlds collide on February 18th, 1964, at least in Bob Lipsight's mind. And he didn't know what to make of it. He didn't know if the Beatles were going to make it. He didn't know if Cassius Clay was going to beat uh, Sonny Liston for the heavyweight title. And there is Sonny Liston, the bear, the toughest guy around, the guy who could punch, uh, the guy who is in prison, uh, and, and he's the baddest man on the planet. Uh, and uh, finally, the doors open. And you got pictures like this at uh, Angelo Dundee's Fifth Street Gym. And there is Ali. And Ali, when he comes into the room, into the boxing ring, says to his handler, maybe it was uh, uh, Drew uh, Houdini Brown uh, or one of the other people in the uh, inner circle at that time. Uh, I knew the later inner circle, the 70s inner circle, Shelley Saltman, those people. Um, anyway, he says to one of them, who are those four sissy boys over there? He had no idea who they were. And they knew who he was, but Leonard didn't want to be there. But all of a sudden, the photographers start flashing and the TV, and the, TV the film starts rolling. And these guys go right into the showbiz shtick. He puts his fist out. They fall over. Ringo jumps on his back. He's carrying Ringo around. It was like these guys rehearsed the scene. They never met each other. They had no idea who they were. In fact, you know, Cassius Clay dismissed them. And of course, London dismissed Cassius Clay. The lip side talks about how the worlds collided, how he could have wasted his time with these four guys from England who had a couple hits and this guy who lost to Sonny Liston. That's how close it was to not having two 1960s icons. And by the time uh, I was with Ali, that's 1985 um, at Madison Square Garden at a luncheon. Um, Ali couldn't talk anymore. Uh, the Parkinson's had kicked in and um, it was, it was, he was signing autographs and they had to tell him how to spell his name because he was punch drunk and he had the Parkinson's. So he had some, some problems there, but that's uh, Ali in 1985. Of course, he beat Sonny Liston. Beatles have five number one hits in the United States on the Billboard chart. They go on to make the movie Hard Day's Night. He becomes the heavyweight champion. They both become cultural icons for different reasons in the 1960s. Um, Ali, uh, there's me interviewing Ali back in 1982 when he still could uh, had the ability to uh, interview. In fact, you can see that uh, my microphone is kind of pulled back to me and he's kind of listening, kind of listening to whatever question I'm asking. Uh, Dundee had the gym where uh, Cassius Clay trained for his fight against Liston, the Fifth Street Gym. And there is Angelo Dundee, and there is my son at the new Fifth Street Gym, which wasn't on Fifth Street in Miami Beach anymore, back in uh, 1994. That's uh, when that picture was. Uh, Ali, win or Cassius Clay, wins the title, and he becomes a very controversial figure because he's been hanging out with Malcolm X. And uh, he's basically about ready to become a member of the Nation of Islam. And he doesn't have a name at this point. He's just known as Cassius X at this point. March 6, 1964, Elijah Muhammad, who is the Nas uh, Nation of Islam leader, announced that the new heavyweight champion of the world would no longer be known as Cassius Clay. This Clay name has no meaning, um, uh, um, Elijah Muhammad said in a radio address. Muhammad Ali is what I will give him as long as he believes in Allah and follows me. Eventually, they would have a falling out. And of course, Malcolm X would have a falling out with uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad. And uh, apparently, there was a meeting that uh, included Ali and Jim Brown and Sam Cooke and Malcolm X back in Miami in uh, 1964. That is now a Netflix, uh, I think it's Netflix, uh, movie about the four of them coming together. Uh, the only one who could talk about that today is Jim Brown. So it's Jim Brown, Ali, Malcolm X, and Sam Cooke. Those three are dead. Jim Brown is still around. Uh, many newspapers did not want to call Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali. The New York Times editor Abe Rosenthal, and the uh, Lipsite was no fan of uh, Abe Rosenthal. 
uh, was emphatic about being, he is Cash's client until he changes his name in the court of law, but you didn't have to do that in 1960 or the 1960s. Ali never changed his name legally, but under the 1960 laws, he didn't have to. So he was Muhammad Ali. As late as September 18, 1970, the New York Times headline, State, Georgia, after Ali was stripped of his title, State will grant Clay ring license because Abe Rosenthal decided as the executive editor of the New York Times, his name was Cassius Clay. Uh, meanwhile, the Beatles, the Beatles take a civil rights stand after the Civil Rights Act is passed in 1964. The only time the Beatles played in Florida was September 11th, 1964, and they almost did not play at the Gaither Bowl. Why? Because the Gaither Bowl was segregated. And the Beatles as a group said, hey, you know, our heroes are Chuck Berry. People like Chuck Berry are our heroes, Little Richard. You know, we would want them to sit in the crowd with everybody else. Um, no, you know what? If, if you segregate, we're not playing. Uh, the Beatles uh, did perform on September 11th, 1964 in Jacksonville at the Gaither Bowl. Uh, they issued a statement on September 6, 1964. We're not appearing unless Negroes are allowed to sit anywhere. Uh, they desegregated the Gaither Bowl in 1964. Oh, meanwhile, Sonny Liston, right? Uh, by 1967, Ali is going to jail because um, he refuses. Uh, in fact, this album comes out after April 27, 1967, when Ali uh, decides he's not going to take the oath uh, to the United States military. Uh, if you take a look at that uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Club Hearts album cover, take a look on the left, the mannequin Beatles, to their right, to your left, is Sonny Liston. John Lennon never gave up on his love of Sonny Liston. There is the mock-up that was used on the cover of the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. Liston lost to uh, Clay Ali in 64 and in 65 and basically was shot by the uh, 65 uh, and eventually would die. Die uh, under mysterious circumstances after the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album came out. The Beatles never gave up, though, um, or Lennon never gave up on Ali, nor did Paul McCartney. McCartney, uh, when the Beatles were on, uh, when McCartney was on tour in 1976, uh, was asked about the Beatles reunited, and he would do a Muhammad Ali imitation. Uh, the Beatles are fine after splitting in 69, uh, sounding just like Ali. Meanwhile, Lennon. Lennon apparently had a change of heart about uh, Ali because in 1972, he starts writing a song called I'm the Greatest. Muhammad Ali's uh, trademark, the um, uh, trademark GOAT, G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time. And Lennon is writing a song, I'm the Greatest, but he realizes, you know, I can't write this about myself. Ah, Ringo, let's get Ringo. Ringo sing I'm the Greatest, and he does. It is probably the last session that the Beatles, because Lennon would get killed in 1980, did together, or three quarters of the Beatles, with Ringo singing, Lennon writing the song, playing the guitar, and George Harrison playing the guitar. It's called I'm the Greatest by Ringo Starr. And of course, what's the line from? It's Ali. This is Lennon and uh, Ali and Yoko Ono, 1977, Jimmy Carter's inaugural. And I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, maybe uh, Yoko Ono is looking at the, at the uh, check uh, at the Jimmy Carter inaugural. Um, and uh, there they are, Ali and uh, Lennon, even though Lennon never gave up his love of Sonny Liston. Oh, the 1964 World's Fair. I know one person worked at the 1964 World's Fair. Um, the Unisphere has been rebuilt. That's a picture from a couple of years ago when you could safely go out in public without a mask. And uh, the rebuilt Unisphere. Not much remains of the 1964 World's Fair. 1964 World's Fair was kind of Walt Disney's test ground for Disneyland and Disney World. Get into that in a second. Uh, the World's Fair wasn't an official World's Fair because Robert Moses went to the World's Fair Commission saying, uh, yeah, you know, we're going to have a World's Fair. And they said, no, we just had a World's Fair in Seattle in 1962. We're having one in Montreal in 1967. But uh, Robert Moses wasn't going to be too concerned about some group saying you can't be or you can't have uh, the name the World's Fair. I mean, that wasn't Robert Moses style. So, yeah, he goes ahead and, well, we're going to have a corporate World's Fair. 
Peace through understanding. Now, Abbott Flushing Meadows Park, as you know, there's 650 acres of land out there, some of which has been taken by the United States Tennis Association for the US Open over there. But the public spaces are, are still there. And, some of the relics from the World's Fair are still there. Countries, cities, corporations, private groups set up shop to display their ideas and accomplishments. It's more than 50 million visitors. Uh, some of those visitors didn't pay. Anybody who went there that's kind of snuck in, that wants to give me a story that uh, they kind of climbed that hill on the side of the Grand Central Parkway and got to a garbage can and flipped, uh, and flipped the garbage can over and climbed the fence and then just hopped in and didn't pay to get in. Anybody have that story here? Because it seems like a lot of people have the same story that I've been told over the years that you could just sneak in. There's not a problem sneaking in. And there is Lyndon Johnson with Lady Bird Johnson, and uh, they're walking down that avenue that still exists that leads now to the tennis center uh, at the opening of the World's Fair in 1964. Robert Moses, well, he did a lot of things. One thing he did was put on the World's Fair that was on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, the ticket organizers thought they were going to sell 70 million tickets over two years. They didn't. Um, they borrowed money to get through the 1965 year, 64, 65 year. World's Fair wasn't as popular as they had hoped. Uh, and um, there was a relic of the World's Fair, uh, the New York State Pavilion that just sits there, it sits there decays, rots. Oh, it was in Men in Black. They did that movie in the late 1980s and used that as an alien scene. But um, that thing is still there. They're talking about uh, redoing it. It's going to cost maybe as much as $200 million to redo it, uh, to get the elevators working again and get everything going in the New York State uh, exhibit. And um, that's not far from where you could hop the fence and sneak in. Walt Disney, Walt Disney had his fingerprints all over this World's Fair. Well, maybe not his fingerprints. He was watching what was going on at the World's Fair. And he's sitting there and he's watching, knowing that he wants to build a place in Florida, um, and which he would announce in 1965, but he had picked that out in 1963 near Orlando. And so he's using the World's Fair to test things out. And uh, he looks at this thing. This was in the Illinois Pavilion. And it was a robot, Abe Lincoln robot. And Disney liked the Abe Lincoln robot. And he made many more robots of presidents. And it became the Hall of Presidents eventually. And that would end up at Disney World. The other thing that uh, he took out of the World's Fair, besides marketing um, himself and looking at what was going on in terms of who was coming, what they were doing, what they liked, what they didn't like, was it's a small world. Most people like it's a small world. My daughter hated it. She was two years old. She hates the song to this day. She hates the ride to this day. She was two and a half years old. She was in Disney World, January of 1986. And she still talks about how much she hates. It's a small world. She hates the song, she hates the ride. Anyway, it's a small world. That was a Disney creation specifically for the 1964-65 World's Fair. Uh, he got some support from the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF. It was a huge hit during the two years it was at the fair. And Disney liked it so much, he packed it up, shipped it off to Anaheim, and it opens on May 28th, 1966. As people know in the New York area, there's hardly anything that's left from the World's Fair except for, for the fields. Um, from the 1939 World's Fair, you have that waterway that's in between the Van Wyck and the Grand Central Parkway. Um, the Unisphere is still there. There are some artifacts that are still there from the 1964 World's Fair, but few and far between. Lots of soccer fields there now. Very few baseball fields. Lots of soccer fields. And that's kind of interesting because the Mets play literally a fly ball away from the soccer fields. We go to Alaska. That was Easter Sunday, uh, Easter weekend, actually, in Alaska. And it's the Great Earthquake. And uh, I was on a cruise ship. I speak on cruise ships. And I was up in Alaska in 2006. And we went down on a train from Anchorage down to uh, Whittier, uh, where you catch the cruise ships uh, in Alaska. Whittier was a town that uh, was formed during World War II. 
And it's always, it's a marine layer there. And back in the day, you couldn't see it flying overhead. Now you can because of radar and all that other stuff. And that's where the cruise ships get out. And uh, there are still some areas that are like this in Alaska that they never bothered to uh, fix up after the great earthquake in 1964. The great Alaska earthquake, 536 in the evening, uh, which was 1036 New York time. And uh, I remember, I remember watching that uh, on TV that day and the next day. It was on March 27th, 1964. I watched the 11 o'clock news back in the day. I was six years old. I was watching it because I knew I wanted to get into journalism even at the age of five or six. Uh, the shaking lasted for about four minutes. There were tsunamis. There was a killer landslide. And at the time, the biggest earthquake ever in the United States history. Uh, John Kennedy was killed on November 22nd, 1963, and um, there, people in Washington wanted some answers. So they went to the Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren and said, um, we want some answers. Put together a commission and give us the answers. And uh, Earl Warren did. One of the people he hired was a young Pennsylvania attorney by the name of Arlen Specter. Uh, and another guy on the Warren Commission was Gerald Ford, and they came out with the official report on the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1964. On September 24th, the Warren Commission report was given to Lyndon Johnson. September 27th, three days later, it, it's released to the public. Uh, the report concluded that the gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, acted alone. They did not know the motive in assassinating John Kennedy and that Jack Ruby had acted alone in his murder of the suspect, Oswald. And since then, people have doubted this report. Now, I haven't been in Dallas in a long time. The last time I was in Dallas was in 2000, and I went to Dealey Plaza. And you have all these people there selling books and their own newspapers and DVDs and all this other stuff um, with their conspiracy theories. And uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions about the Warren Commission. And uh, in uh, the year 2039, uh, 75 years afterwards, uh, a report or, or all the artifacts are supposed to be released because they figured everybody would be dead by that point who would remember 1963. Um, why was Jack Ruby at the Dallas police station so close to Oswald? You know, that, that's a question that you know, people sus suspect they have an answer to, but they really never got an answer to it. So Peter, uh, people doubted the report and that led the rise to conspiracy theories. 1964, that was a presidential year. Lyndon Johnson, the Democrat, Barry Goldwater, the Republican. And Goldwater was critical of uh, Johnson's liberal domestic agenda rallied against welfare programs, defended his decision to vote against the Civil Rights Act, which was passed on July 7th. And Goldwater kind of never said it, but he seemed to suggest that, hey, you know what, we got nuclear weapons, let's get rid of Cuba, let's get North, rid of North Vietnam. Yeah, let's, let's use the nukes there. And that, came, that gave birth to this commercial, the daisy chain commercial with the little girl pulling the pedals off of the daisy and then boom, the big mushroom cloud. I don't know how effective it was. And I don't know if you played it today, how people would take it uh, because a lot has happened since 1964. But 1964, it was a big deal. Johnson would defeat Goldwater, get 60% of the vote. Johnson uh, turned back the conservative Senator to secure his first full term in office after succeeding John Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. And there is Martin Luther King, who won the Nobel Peace Prize that year. He was 35 years old, and he was the youngest person ever to receive that award. Another major award that was given for the first time ever, the Academy Awards gave an award to an African American, although Sidney Poitier is not an African American. Um, he becomes the first black performer on April 13th, 1964, to uh, win an Academy Award for his performance in Lilies of the Field. That was 1964, first black performer to get an Academy Award. How many of you know this woman? 
you should, if you ever watch the uh, television series Dallas in 1980. Anybody know who she is? Give me three seconds to tell me. If you don't know who she is, I will tell you who she is in a second. That is Linda Gray, who played the wife Sue Ellen of uh, uh, Larry Hagman's character, J.R. Ewing in uh, Dallas, the suffering wife of J.R. Ewing. But she was a fashion model. And in 1974, you couldn't use this ad, this ad today. You could not use it, violence against women. But she's got black eyes and she's smoking a cigarette. Us Territon smokers would rather fight than switch. Join the unswitchables. Get the filter cigarette with the taste worth fighting for. Territon. Well, 1964 is the year that Luther L. Terry, Dr. Terry, the Surgeon General of the United States, released the first report, although this was known in the 1930s about smoking and somehow was... Uh, smothered until 1964. Uh, the first report, the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health, uh, cause of cancer, probable cause of cancer in women, lung cancer, important cause of chronic bronchitis. And it was the first time uh, a warning was put on the cigarette package uh, that smoking could be hazardous to your health. And we end with a show that I used to watch when I was seven years old. That was the week that was. That was the week that was, it's over, let it go, sung by Nancy Ames, the TW3 girl. It was hosted by David Frost, who hosted the show in England and flew over to the United States, hosted in the United States. Now, on NBC, January 10th, 64 through May 4th, 1965, uh, some of the people who are connected to the show, aside from Frost, Nancy Ames, the singer, Henry Morgan, a humorist, uh, Woody Allen, who's been in the news lately, uh, Steve Allen, Alan Sherman, hello mother, hello father, here I am at Camp Granada, Buck Henry, who at Mel Brooks would create uh, Get Smart, among other things, Dick Knoll, Elliot Reed, the songs of Tom Lehrer, who basically gave it up soon after that, wrote a bunch of songs, that was it, never heard from him again, Pat Anglin, Phyllis Newman, Bob Dishy, Mort Saul, who would have loved the internet today because Mort Saul had a ticker tape uh, machine put into his house so he could read the latest news and incorporate it in his act. He'd be great today uh, if he was around today doing his stand-up with the internet. He, he'd love that. And Jerry Damon announcing. That was the week that was. Uh, yeah, if you go up to YouTube, you'll see uh, the comedy and or satire, and you could make the the case that that was the week that was really was the father of the Smothers Brothers show, and the father of what eventually would be Saturday Night Live when it started, and uh, the Daily Show with John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and uh, all the others. You could make that case. Uh, it started in England. And uh, originally, some of the writers in England, Graham Chapman and John Cleese, who were part of Monty Python. Uh, the BBC version of the show got complaints about David Frost. Lord Aldington, the vice chairman of the Conservative Party, wrote to the BBC Director General Hugh Green that David Frost had a hatred of the prime minister, which he finds impossible to control. It was also something else. The program attracted complaints from the Boy Scout Association of England. They questioned the sexuality of its founder, Lord Baden Powell. That's still floating around all these years later. That was the week that was. That was the week that was. It's over. Let it go. Oh, what a week that was. That was the week that was. And that was the year that was. It's over. Let it go. Oh, what a year that was. That was the year that was. And if you look at what happened in 1964, uh, you had hairdos like that. Uh, I don't know. Would you go in proper society looking like with that hairdo on the right? Uh, 1964 featured the start of the Vietnam War, civil rights struggles in the United States. Beatlemania, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali and the Beatles remain important to history all these years later, 57 years later. A civil war in Cyprus and a change in the USSR. The New York World's Fair opened. The first baby boomers turned 18. Three of them became presidents. Uh, there was, uh, the world was changing and the events that happened in 1964 would impact people 
well into the 21st century. And we kind of had sort of a replay of 1964 last summer with the dancing in the streets. Thank you, Catherine, for inviting me. I am going to open this thing up and uh, let you talk because I've done enough talking. Questions, answers, <laughs> comments, criticisms, the floor is yours. Somebody's got to say something. Yeah, Evan. Yes, Kent, how are you? How are you doing? Well, good. I, Since finally, I, finally, I, spoke... I finally got my new wheelchair all hooked up. Good. Kent was at my talk last night. What do you got to add? Um, well, I got two things. First of all, Men in Black was in the mid-90s. Oh, okay. You said the 80s. It okay. was in the mid-90s. Now, now, here's a story about Miami Beach. Thank you, Darth. About, about Miami Beach. My dad and stepmother get married in 1968. They go to Miami Beach for their honeymoon. They're driving down Biscayne Boulevard looking for the hotel. My dad is going 20 miles an hour looking for the hotel, right? In a rental car. The police pull him over and arrest him for speeding. He was going 20 miles an hour. The police pull him over. They take him in. He get and he gives him. Uh, they were going to hold him on over the weekend until Monday. Um, but then, but then my dad realized that his AAA card is still it was good for bail. So he gives a AAA card. He goes back to the hotel. Monday morning, he goes to court before, you know, you know they're supposed to get back to Detroit, Windsor on, uh, on, uh, that, on the early flight. Uh, they had to change their flight and everything like that. But they go, they go to the, my dad and stepmother go to the, uh, uh, to the uh, police station and they go into traffic court or no tourist court tourist court tourist court they, what what they did was back in that time was on the rental cars they had a sticker on the rental cars that let people that let the cops know that they were tourists and it was and and it was like fifty dollars or whatever it was 25 bucks you it, know i mean your money yeah you know <laughs> hey they should they should have gone to juniors for uh to eat <laughs> yeah there, yeah fountain blue. yeah so <laughs> that you know that was pretty um but um uh, 1964 uh, was the year that we 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 moved out of Detroit to Redford. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I was, it, I was I was six years old. I was almost six years old when that when we moved to Redford. Anybody uh, else? Anybody else who has a, anybody who watched the Beatles on Ed Sullivan? Oh, I did. I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Catherine watched the Beatles and Ed Sullivan. You're one of the 73 million. So I want to thank Doris. Uh, that was great. Thank you, Doris. And thank you, uh, Barbara. And uh, anybody else before I wrap this thing up? Thank you, Catherine, for inviting me. Thank you to the Rye Reading Room. Uh, hopefully next time we do this, we could be in person. Yeah. I'm uh, doing cool. that. I mean, I got my shots, so can't move my arm, but I got my shots. So today, uh, I just want to send a shout out to FEMA. We were down in Yonkers today and, um, oh, uh, Linda had a ride on the Goodyear blimp at the World's Fair. I didn't do that. Uh, I, I went into the Ford Pavilion and I saw Dino the Dinosaur and all that other stuff. Uh, I do want to say that FEMA did a great job down in Yonkers at the uh, Armory. I was in and out in 27 minutes, and that included 15 minutes for sitting there. 
And um, they were just uh, the, the National Guard, the Army, FEMA, they were just great down there. And I had two great experiences with them. So uh, now that uh, I'm all vaccinated up, maybe eventually I could go back to proper society. So, which is good. Any 